This talk is the first introductory talk of an online course on Galois theory. So what I'll be doing is just giving a sort of informal overview of what Galois theory is and what you can do with it. So very briefly, Galois theory takes problems about polynomials and turns them into um, problems about um, groups. Um, roughly speaking, if you've got a polynomial, you can get a group out of it, which is called its Galois group. And what I'll do now is just give a few historic examples of this. So um, perhaps the most famous of them is, is the problem about um, can a polynomial be solved by radicals? Um, now, there's one case of this everybody knows. If you've got a polynomial ax squared plus bx plus c equals naught, you can solve it by radicals, meaning you can write down an expression for x in terms of a, b, and c. Um, x is minus b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. And you notice this expression only involves the usual four arithmetic operations together with taking nth roots. And you can ask, can you do this with higher degree polynomials? And um, the answer is you can do it for degree less than or equal to 4. And no, in general, for degree greater than or equal to 5. So this is the arbel ruffini theorem. It's not entirely clear who proved it first. Ruffini had a sort of 500-page proof of it, um, except no one's really quite sure whether it was a proof of it or not, and it's sort of suspect that it wasn't. And a little bit later, Arbel came along and gave a very clear six-page proof of it. So um, it's a complicated problem for historians to figure out how, how the credit should be divided. Um, anyway, if you turn this into Galois theory, if you've got a degree n polynomial, um, you get a Galois group, which is a subgroup of the symmetric group on n points S n. And it turns this problem about um, whether a polynomial can be solved by radicals into the problem about whether, whether this subgroup um, is solvable. So solvable, um, if you remember from a group theory course, means it can be split into abelian groups in some sense. Here you notice abelian groups are, of course, named after Arbel. Um, and the answer is, um, for group theory, it's fairly easy to show that the group S1, S2, S3 and S4 are solvable but S5 is not. So if you find a polynomial whose Galois group is S5, then you can't solve it by radicals. Um, incidentally, the, the term solvable for solvable groups comes from this correspondence. It sort of refers to the fact that an equation is solvable by radicals if its Galois group is solvable. Um, so we'll be covering that later on and explaining why um, an equation can't be solved by radicals if it has Galois group S5. And also we'll be showing how you can solve an equation by radicals for the degree at most 4 using the structure of the Galois group. Um, if you don't know the Galois group, this is actually very tricky to do. I mean, it's really impressive that people manage to solve equations for degree 4 without knowing about group theory. Um, so um, another classical example is... Um, trisecting the angle. Well, here we've got a polynomial. We might, well, we can trisect, try and trisect an angle of 60 degrees with ruler and compass. And here we've got a polynomial, and we might take the polynomial whose roots are cosine um, of 60 degrees over 3 and whatever its other roots are. And 
This turns out to correspond, you can find a Galois group of this polynomial and it um, turns out to correspond to a Galois group which is cyclic of order 3. Um, and it turns out that being able to construct something with ruler and compass is very closely related to the, to the Galois group being of order a power of 2. And as the Galois group of this is, is not a power of 2, this shows will show you can't trisect an angle. On the other hand, there's another very famous example of this by Gauss, which was the construction of a hepta decagon or a regular hepta decagon. This means a 17-sided regular polygon. Um, and Gauss discovered you could construct this using ruler and compass um, at the age of about 19. So, um, um, in fact, he was so proud of this that he, he, he wanted a hepta decagon carved on his tombstone, but was talked out of it because the stonemason pointed out that a heptadecagon carved in stone would be absolutely indistinguishable from a circle carved in stone, so there wouldn't really be much point. Anyway, um, classifying a heptadecagon turns out to correspond to the following group. You take the cyclic group of order 17 and you look at its automorphism group, and this turns out to have order 16, and 16 is indeed a power of 2, which corresponds to the fact that you can classify, uh, construct this using uh, a, a ruler and compass. Um, so, uh, um, Galois theory was sort of more or less invented by Arbel and Galois, um, and you know, these, the, I mean, everybody involved in this seems to have been incredibly precocious. So Gauss was doing this when he was 19. Arbel was actually dead by the age of 25. Um, so, you know, he, 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 he made himself world famous inventing abelian groups and Galois theory and so on in, in, you know, about the time most of us are just finishing a PhD or whatever. And Galois was even more precocious in that he was actually dead by age 20. So, so Arbel died of tuberculosis. Galois managed to die in a duel of all things. Um, the, the, the circumstances of the duel are a little bit murky, but it appears to have been a sort of argument with someone over a woman or something like that. Um, and the really odd thing about it is nobody at the time seemed to have thought there was anything odd about Galois getting killed in a duel over a woman at age 20. Um, anyway, so um, what's the main idea of Galois theory? So the main idea is, is as follows. Suppose given a polynomial um, a n x to the n plus plus a naught, and let, let's say it has rational coefficients. Um, there are extra complications you get if you look at fields other than the rational numbers that we'll talk about. And what we do is we look at the field generated by the roots, so alpha 1 up to alpha n. And what we can do is we can form the Galois group, which is all permutations of the roots of, of alpha 1 up to alpha n, preserving all algebraic relations between these roots. So the Galois group is a subgroup of the symmetric group Sn, because it's a subgroup of all permutations, but can be smaller. So, so let's give an explicit example when it's smaller. So if I take the polynomial x to the 5 minus 2, then we can write down the roots alpha 1, alpha 2, alpha 3, alpha 4 and alpha 5 reasonably explicitly. So alpha 1 will be the usual fifth root of 2, which will be a real number. But then you can multiply this by fifth roots of unity. So alpha 2 is going to be the fifth root of 2 times zeta, where zeta is a fifth root of 1. 
and then we'll get the fifth root of 2 times zeta squared, and the fifth root of 2 times zeta cubed, and the fifth root of 2 times zeta to the 4. And now you notice immediately that there are some obvious algebraic relations between them. For example, alpha 1, alpha 3 is equal to alpha 2 squared, um, alpha 2 over alpha 1 is equal to alpha 4 over alpha 3, and so on. So you can't um, do an arbitrary permutation of these and preserve all these relations. In fact, it turns out the subgroup of all permutations preserving all the relations you can think of as order 20 rather than 120, which is the order of Sn. It's actually the Frobenius group of order 20, if you happen to know about Frobenius groups. So this polynomial here has Galois group of order 20. And I said earlier that um, we were going to show that polynomial is solvable by radicals if and only if its Galois group is solvable. And this polynomial is obviously solvable by radicals. We can just take fifth roots and so on. And um, this corresponds to the fact that its Galois group of order 20 is, is a solvable group, whereas the whole symmetric group S5 is not solvable. Um, so uh, the, the, the formulation of a Galois group as being permutations of roots is, is, is the way people used to do things. Um, nowadays we use a slightly more um, flexible formulation. So what we do is we take an extension of fields. We might take a field K contained in a field L and we will usually assume this is a finite extension, meaning that L is a finite dimensional vector space over K, but that's not really essential. And the Galois group um, will be the symmetries of L fixing all elements of K. You might ask, why don't we just define it to be this group of all symmetries of L and forget about the subfield K? Well, you could if you wanted, but it turns out to be really convenient to have a sort of relative notion of Galois group where you fix some elements of, of K, where you fix all the elements of K. So, so the idea is a, a major theme in Galois theory is, is to sort of do things in steps. So you might have a field M containing a field L containing a field K. And to prove things about M, you first of all go up from K to L and then you go up from L to M. So, so it's very useful to, to consider two fields rather than just one field because this makes the proofs a lot easier. Um, so a fairly typical example of this will be you take the real numbers contained in the complex numbers. So what we want is all symmetries of the complex numbers that fix all real numbers. And it's not too difficult to see what those are. The Galois group has two elements. One is the identity element and the other is complex conjugation. So you remember if you take a number x plus i y, you can take its complex conjugate, which is x minus i y. And this preserves all field operations. So z1, z2, um, the complex conjugate of that is the complex conjugate of z1 times the complex conjugate of z2. And the same for addition and subtraction and nearly everything else. So, so complex conjugation is a symmetry of the complex numbers. So here the, the Galois group just contains two elements. So it's the group of order two, and um, this makes the complex numbers particularly easy to deal with if you know the real numbers, because this, this group is so small and easy. Um, so um, we can state the main theorem of Galois theory. This says, suppose that K contained in L is a Galois extension. Well, what does this mean? Well, it means the size of the Galois group, the number of elements, is equal to the degree of L over K. Uh, so this is just the dimension of L as a vector space over K. And here we're going to assume that this is finite. Infinite Galois extensions are a little bit more complicated. 
Um, so we'll see that the Galois group always has order at most equal to this, and if it has order equal to that, then we call this a Galois extension. And the main theorem says that um, then subfields M with K contained in M contained in L correspond exactly to subgroups of the Galois group. So if we can figure out the Galois group, then we know absolutely every field that lies between K and L. And as we'll see later in the course, this often allows us to, to answer questions about L, such as whether, whether or not you can, you can express every element of L in using radicals in terms of elements of K. Um, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to give a very, very brief overview of some applications of Galois theory. Um, these are mostly going to be rather advanced applications that I'm not going to cover in the course. This is just to give you some idea of what people use Galois theory for. So at the moment, the, the really topical one is the Langlands program. So what does the Langlands program say? Well, it says very roughly that Galois groups of fields L containing the rational numbers are something to do with modular forms. So a typical example of a modular form might be the famous um, discriminant function, um, which is q times product over n greater than or equal to 1 of 1 minus q to the n. So the coefficient is going to be q minus 24q plus 252q squared. So now these coefficients are the famous um, values of the Ramanujan's tau function, um, which has all sorts of weird properties. For example, tau m tau n is equal to tau m n if m and n are co-prime, which was conjectured by Ramanujan. Um, so modular forms are very intriguing and interesting objects, and you can spend an entire semester just explaining what they are. And the Langlands program makes the rather extraordinary claim that representations of Galois groups of fields, that means ways that Galois groups can act on vector spaces, are something to do with modular forms. And explaining the meaning of something to do with um, is really difficult. You can spend a lifetime trying to understand just what this correspondence actually um, actually means, never mind actually prove bits of it. Whenever you can prove bits of this correspondence, it, it generally leads to um, very, very striking results. Um, for example, Weil's um, proved Fermat's last theorem, and the way he proved Fermat's last theorem was you, you, you take a potential solution of um, Fermat's equation, and from this, you get something called an elliptic curve. This bit was done by Frey. It's called the Frey curve. And the elliptic curve has an action of the Galois group of the rationals. So from a solution to Fermat's last theorem, you can get some sort of action of the Galois group. And then Weil showed that from this, you can get a certain modular form. So Wiles's main step was to go from an elliptic curve to a modular form. Um, and um, he used the um, representation of the Galois group to construct this modular form. And most of his paper is, a, is essentially a study of, of um, the action of this Galois group. And finally, um, Ken Ribbit showed that this modular form you can construct from a solution of Fermat's last theorem is not possible. So um, this ends up proving Fermat's last theorem. And somehow the really hard step of this involves studying um, Galois theory. Um, another weird place Galois theory turns up is it's um, a Galois group 
turns out to be related or at least analogous to a fundamental group in algebraic topology. Um, so if we've got an extension of fields, um, this turns out to correspond to some sort of covering space. So a covering space might look like you've got some sort of topological space such as a circle, and then there's another topological space lying above it, which is locally an isomorphism. You see, if, if you take some small point up here and take a small neighbourhood of the point, it maps isomorphically onto a small neighbourhood of its image there. So you should think of a covering space as being something like a field extension. So in this case, uh, I guess we should have the field mapping to a bigger field L. Um, unfortunately, there's a sort of reversal of arrows that maps between fields go in the opposite direction to corresponding maps between covering spaces. Now the Galois group of, um, has something to do with the fundamental group of the base space. Let's, let's take this base space to be S1. So it's sort of analogous to the fundamental group of S1. So you remember the fundamental group of a topological space means you pick a point and you look at all ways you can map a circle into it starting at that point up to homotopy and you can compose these by following one loop and then composing it with the other loop. And this turns out to be analogous to composing elements of the Galois group. And, a little, and later on we'll be talking about the algebraic closure. So for any field we will construct an algebraic closure. And the algebraic closure turns out to correspond to a universal covering space. So the universal covering space is in some sense the biggest simply connected covering space you can think of. So for a circle, the universal covering space kind of looks like an infinite helix. Um, I haven't drawn this helix very well, but you can sort of think of a big helix like that. And the fundamental group um, would actually be the integers, which sort of corresponds to automorphisms of this helix over the circle. Um, in fact, this relation between Galois theory and fundamental groups is not just an analogy. Grothendieck showed that they're both special cases of the same thing in some sense. So he invented a generalization of topology called etal topology and showed that in the etal topology, the fundamental group of an extension of fields is more or less a, a sort of fundamental group of the base field, or at least related to it. So fundamental groups in algebraic topology and Galois groups in field theory turn out to be in some sense almost the same thing. Um, so I'll just finish by mentioning an old classical problem in Galois theory that still hasn't yet been solved. This is the so-called inverse problem. And it's very easy to state. So given a finite group G, Is there an extension um, K of the rational numbers um, so that the Galois group of K over Q is G? Here I should say that um, K has to be a Galois extension. I should have said that as well. Um, and this is known to be true for many groups. For instance, Shafarovich proved it for all solvable groups. And later in the course, we will prove it for abelian groups. And it's been proved for quite a lot of simple groups, but it's still a completely open problem in general. OK, so the next lecture will just be a sort of review of field extensions and algebraic numbers and things like that.